Let's pray. God, I pray in this next few moments that you would be breaking chains today, that you would be setting people free, that we would see clearly who you are so that we would know who you have called us to be. And so teach us, Jesus. We ask it in your name. Amen. Well, we're continuing in our series, uh, I Am, and we started this series with really this premise that if we could take any one of these things that we're talking about over these last five weeks, that any one of these would change the way you live, that you would have a better life if you would just implement any one of these. But if you put all five of these together, that it would radically transform your life. And so we started out several weeks ago with this idea that you are created. You're not here by accident. You didn't just happen, that God had an intentional purpose. You were created and that you're just not number whatever billion uh, person that has been on this earth. But God loves you dearly and he calls you a son or a daughter. And then that the one who created the universe is the one who hears every cry of your heart. He is not too busy to pay attention to everything that is going on in your life and hears anything that you want to lift up to him. And today we want to get our mind around our fourth in this series. And the word is simply forgiven. And to be forgiven really is the message of the church. That really, frankly, is the only message of the church, that we lift up the name of Jesus because only in Jesus is there forgiveness. Only in Jesus is there hope. Only in Jesus is there life. And so after Jesus dies and he ascends into heaven, John, one of his disciples, wants this to be so clear to people that he writes in one of his letters to followers of Jesus, he writes this in his first epistle in the second chapter. He says, I am writing to you, dear children, your sons and daughters of the King of Kings, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name, the name of Jesus. Not that your sins might be forgiven or could be forgiven, that your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. And at this point, we could just say, amen, have a wonderful day and enjoy the rest of your day. Because what else can you say to that except amen? Because that is what we proclaim. That is what we teach. But the problem with this is, is most people don't live this way. And why don't they live this way? Which leads us to the question we're asking this morning. If I'm forgiven, why do I still feel guilt? And why do I still feel shame? A lot of followers of Jesus aren't exempt from feeling guilt and shame, which bodes that question. And so I want to take a look at something Paul wrote, and it's a great chapter. I encourage you to dive into that yourself. I'm just going to give you one verse of this in 2 Corinthians. He says, godly sorrow, this is a sorrow, and sorrow is not a bad thing. There's a godly sorrow. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, no guilt, no shame, no regrets. But worldly sorrow, there's another kind of sorrow, brings death. And so you break that down a little bit. It's pretty simple to look at. But godly sorrow, what happens with godly sorrow? Well, godly sorrow very simply um, brings repentance. That's what happens. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. And what is repentance? Well, repentance is, I don't like what I just did. And that is not who I am. That is not who I want to become. That is not what I, the story that I want to tell of my life. I hate what I just did. And to repent is to change, to turn, to change direction and say, I don't want to go in that direction any longer. So godly sorrow, what does it do? Well, it leads to repentance and that leads to salvation, which means I have been set free. Man, I have nothing to worry about and it leaves no regret and it leads to eternal life. That's what it leads to. But worldly sorrow, what happens with worldly sorrow? Well, that just leads to death. So what does worldly sorrow look like? Worldly sorrow looks like our confession before. I'm just worried about not getting caught. Or I'm sorry I got caught. I feel shame that I got caught. 
Worldly sorrow says something along the lines of, I'm sorry if I offended you with that. That's what worldly sorrow is. And where does worldly sorrow lead? Well, it ultimately leads to death. Because if you follow worldly sorrow for too long, all you realize is I'm holding this box of shame and guilt in my hand. And it's still there. And the more you heap into that box, the heavier it is to carry. And it leads to death ultimately. And only Jesus has the answer that I am forgiven. And so what we want to do today is unpack the reading that Jessica read for us just a moment ago from Psalm 25. And I love this psalm. And if you've heard me preach before, I've said it many times. I love the psalms, but this is one of those psalms that transformed my life. And so I want to share this one with you. If you've got your Bible, we'll project it up here as well. If you've got the outline in front of you, or you can look at the YouVersion Bible app, you get all the blanks filled in and it's there for you as well. Or you just got the old fashioned Bible like me. Open it up to Psalm 25 and want to take a look at these words. It starts out this, in you, Lord, my God, I put my trust. The old New International Version before the new edition came out had a different way of saying that. It says, oh, to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. And, and I like that picture better because that it, for me is such a wonderful image in my mind. And in that idea of, O oh, Lord, I put my trust or I lift up my soul to you. In, in Hebrew, there's a word for that. It's nasa. And I like that because if you phonetically spell nasa, it is N-A-S-A or NASA. And having spent time in Houston and over in Florida and having known some astronauts, um, the picture I get in my mind when I think of this is... And I tell you, it's amazing if you've ever been at a launch and if you've ever been a part of those things. I love that idea because this is what God is asking us to do. This is what the psalmist is inviting us to be a part of, is to lift up our soul. God, I'm putting all of my trust in you. I'm not sort of hoping this thing goes off. I don't have a whole bunch of contingency plans. They're not, uh, the astronauts are not asking the engineers, hey, do you think we're going to make it into space? Like, no, we're going to make it into space. We spent a lot of time and a lot of discussion and a lot of uh, calibrations and a lot of mathematical formulas. We, we've got this thing pinned down. You are going into space. And so they go, and when they launch that thing, it's not, well, I hope that thing works. They're like, no, we're pretty sure this thing is going to work. we got some emergency plans, but, man, this thing is going up into space. And it is amazing when it goes. I, I remember I was on a softball field in Florida, and um, one of those evenings we're still putting up space shuttles, and, and you sort of heard the ground rumble a little. We're like 50 miles away from that. We're like, man, what is going on? Like, oh, that's right, the space shuttle is going off today. And so everybody stops. Like, we're just the game stops for a moment everybody's looking up in the sky and all of a sudden you see you see the the light in the sky and then you see the shuttle just taken off like that is just incredibly majestic and i love that picture because that is what god invites us to do oh lord i, I want to lift up my soul to you i'm putting all of my trust into you and i'm not doing it in 10 different areas i'm putting all my focus into this one thing i'm lifting it up to you god that's the way i want to start and when you start your approach with that it's a lot easy easier to find out and discover who God is and to connect with him when you put all of your trust in him. Verse 2, I trust in you and do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. And I find that's a very interesting phrase, put to shame. Don't let me be put to shame. And the image I have in my mind is almost like Monopoly. Have you ever played that, the old go to jail kind of thing? And you roll, you know, doubles three times or you land on that or you get a thing. And this is the picture I get in my mind. Go to shame. Because this is the world, don't we? Don't we live in a world that loves to shame people? I mean, we love that. And what I hate about our, our world today is it seems like we just coax people to do the wrong thing. Oh, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. And all of a sudden they step across whatever this line is in society like, oh, how could you? Or like, well, wait a minute, it was right, right here, but now it's not right. I was doing all of that right now, but all of a sudden now we got this arbitrary and all of a sudden you're just shamed. And with social media, it is so easy to get just completely overwhelmed with shame. Do not let me be put to shame. A couple weeks ago, I found out about a high school kid that I had mentored and, and still kept in contact with, and, and he made a really, really poor decision and got himself uh, arrested, and he's got some implications with that now. 
And I was really angry uh, with that. I, it's just hard. I'm like, man, you know better than that. And I, I know there's something better inside of you. That is not who you are. And, and, and we've been talking. Like, if that you're struggling with something. Why didn't you bring that up to me? And we could have dealt with that and worked on that. And, and you didn't have to go down that path. But, but you didn't. I found myself really angry with him. But then I, I began to think about this. And I thought, man, if you Googled his name right now, nothing good comes up. Man, there's nowhere to hide when you're full of shame. Because all the world knows. One little Google search will tell you everything that's going on. And I thought, I can't imagine what that's got to feel like for him right now. And Grant, he made a really poor decision. And he's going to have to pay for that really poor decision. But I, I can't imagine what that's like to live in, in that kind of shame. And so I, I, I got to reach out. And so I reached out to him and said, man, I, I don't know if you want to talk, but I, I'm here if you want to talk. And I'm praying for you. And, and forgiveness is yours, too, by the way. It's not just something you heard as a kid. It's true for you that God has forgiven. The cross was enough for that sin and, and for your sin, too, by the way. And the world loves to send us to shame, but that's not where we want to go. Look at verse 3. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. In other words, nobody's going to go to shame and have to live there for the rest of their life. Why? Because that has sin has been paid for. God has taken away even the guilt of our shame and our mistakes and our failures. And I tell you what, I'd love to see at some point when the next person, whoever it is, gets caught um, in something in their past... That I, I wish instead of glossing it over, that really didn't happen. They're not really telling the truth. It was a different time. It was a different age. I, I wish somebody would stand up and say, you know what? I did do that. But uh, years ago, I recognized that. And, and that made my stomach just turn. I hated that about me. And so I got some help with whatever issue I was facing. And I'm not that person anymore. And, and for years, I've been meeting with accountability partners. And I've been set free from that. You're not going to find anybody in the last X number of years who can say that same thing about me. I have been set free from that. I'm not living in guilt and shame anymore. And this is what our world needs. We don't need to live in guilt and shame anymore. But shame will come on those who are treacherous and, and without excuse. So look at verse 3. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame, but shame will come on those who are treacherous and without excuse. And, and treacherous there gives us a picture of, it literally means to cover up. Those who pretend like it's not that big of a deal, or I'm just going to cover it, I'm going to pretend like it's not there, I'm not going to let anybody know what's going on, I'm going to hide it as best I can. Those are the ones who live in shame. And so it makes me think of a little kid. Anybody write on the wall as a kid? Please don't tell me I'm the only one. All right, thank you, Steve, a few others. Appreciate you being honest with that. I, I remember when I did that, and I did it once, because I, I still remember the reaction that I got from my parents when they walked in the room. I can still see my mom's eyes like this big uh, around, like, what on earth are you doing? I'm like, I'm drawing. Like, what do you think I'm doing? I'm just doing what kids do at that point. And, and so, you know, we worked and had to scrub and I helped mom scrub the wall and, and you know, the whole lesson behind all of that. I'm like, I, I never want to do that again. But I, as I was thinking about that, I, I ran across another picture a while ago and I thought, man, this is absolutely beautiful because this is sort of what I feel like most of us do. <laughs> like before mom or dad come, let me just get the paintbrush. I'm going to cover it up as best I can from a little kid vantage point and, and cover it and pretend like it's not there anymore. I thought, yeah, that's, that's what we do. <laughs> We're really good at covering things up. And I think especially in the church, there's something about a church that causes people to just try to cover things up and pretend like nothing's there. And we wonder why we're still living with guilt and we're living with shame. Well, God wants to set you free from that. Look at verse 4. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. I, I love this idea of show me what? Show me your ways, God. I know my ways. I know the direction I want to go. Show me a different way. Show me your way, Lord. Teach me your path. I, I've seen the path I've gone on. I've got my history. But show me your path, God. Guide me in your truth. I know my truth. I know what I believe to be true. But I, I don't want that. I want your truth. God, show me what is true. And I love that. But even the first word, show me, is a little deeper than that. The Hebrew word for that is yada. And if you've heard that before, made famous by Seinfeld episode, yada, yada, yada. You know, you look up in the Urban Dictionary, which is just another way of saying it's just useless. There's really nothing important going on here. It's sort of boring, empty talk. 
But nothing could be further from the truth, from this word. And the psalmist, I think, picks this so intentionally. It's make me know. Make me know your ways, God. Man, make it. I don't want to do it sometimes. I don't want to follow this. But Lord, make me do this. Because I know the direction I go. And I don't want to go down that direction. So make me do this. And he goes down to verse 6. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Mercy and grace wasn't a new thought for God. It's like, you know what, I've done the wrath and I've done the anger thing for a long time. Let me try the mercy and grace out for a little while, see how that one works. No, God has always been merciful and gracious from the very beginning of time. And the psalmist connects with this. Years before Jesus was born on this earth, the psalmist wrote about this. God, I know this to be true about you. You're, you are full of mercy and love. They are from of old. From the very beginning of time, you have always been a God of mercy and and love and then this next verse is the one that so radically transformed my life and just to give you a little backdrop into the story behind this uh, i was at seminary which is grad school for people who want to be a pastor in the lutheran church i was in concordia seminary in st louis missouri and we had one of these long weekends we had a friday and a monday off of school i don't know what holiday that was but they'd given us friday and monday off and everybody went home like it was just like phew, the campus exodus on thursday after classes and i decided i was going to stay because i'm like i was working at little caesars i'm like i can make a lot of money over the weekend because i don't have anything to do i won't have any work to do no classes to attend so i'm just going to work extra hours and so i i worked in friday night closed and we got done it was about one o'clock so i get back to my dorm about 1 30 and there's not a single car on the campus anywhere like everybody is gone it is deserted i go to my dorm there's nobody there at all and it's really sort of a creepy kind of thing just really dark and and so i go into my room and this is before like cell phones before the internet i know that's hard to imagine I, there's nothing to do and i you know turn on the tv and this is back some of you remember that day you turn on the tv that late at night and there's bars you know, kind of thing. It's not 24-7 kind of TV. I know you're like, where are you from? We were born like in the 1800s. It wasn't that long ago that there wasn't TV all night long. There's nothing to do. And dark, quiet, nobody's on campus. And who are you going to call at 1.30 in the morning? All my friends are with family or other places around. There's nobody there. And I remember just sort of sitting in that stillness for a while. And as I was sitting in that, like, what am I going to do? Because I'm hopped up on caffeine. I'm wired from working. And I'm just sitting there. And all of a sudden, this darkness starts creeping in. And then it really got dark. And I kept hearing these thoughts like, I don't really think you're making the good choice here, John. I, I don't think you should be a pastor. If anybody knew of your past and some of the mistakes you've made, oh, you should be filled with guilt and shame. They'd never want you to be their pastor. There are many more people who are a lot smarter than you on this campus. In fact, I think you're the dumbest one on this campus, John. I don't even think you should be in grad school anymore. I think this is a terrible mistake. And if anybody, and I'm just, all of a sudden, it was like this enveloping darkness that I couldn't work my way out of. I'm like, I've never felt this before. I don't know what's going on in this moment. And I remember getting up and I'm sitting on my desk, pulling out a paper. I'm like, okay, how do I resign from grad school? Like, how do I do this? And what am I going to tell my parents and, and what am I going to tell my friends and what am I going to do? And maybe I can work for Little Caesars for the rest of my life. Maybe that's my calling. And maybe some of you are like, well, maybe that would have worked out well. You could have been right across the street. You could have managed that store for us and could have done that. Could have been there. Who knows what God would have done. But as I was doing that and figuring out how I'm going to leave seminary, I heard a voice like, John, pick up your Bible. I'm like, I, okay, it's a big book. You know, like, we'll pick up the portals of prayer devotional that I had on my bedstand. And we have those out in the lobby. It's been around for uh, like 100 years. They've been publishing this thing. And I open it up to the day. And that day was Psalm 25. And because I'm a rule follower, I, I open up my Bible to Psalm 25. I'm going to read what it tells me to read. So I read Psalm 25. And then I get down to this next verse. And, and God just broke through the darkness and broke right into my soul. And I'm embarrassed to say this is the very first verse that I memorized because I wanted to memorize it. I would memorized lots of verses in the Bible because I was told to or because I was forced to or I was bribed to. But this is the first one I committed to memory because I wanted to. And at 23 years of age, God came. And it was like holy ground. And I still see pictures of that seminary dorm room. And, and I remember at that moment, like I was just still there. Like God put a calling on my life and, and awakened my soul. Like, well, what was the verse? Well, we're going to look at the verse right now. Look at verse 7. And I memorized it a little bit different. So I always butcher this one a little bit. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. 
But for your love, O Lord, remember me, for you are good. And remember, I I didn't get any farther than verse 7. And I just wept and wept and wept. I'm like, God, that's exactly what I want. Boy, King David felt the same way. And I'm like, no, no longer are these just people in the Bible. These are, these are people with stories who had the same emotions and feelings that I had. I felt so unworthy, God, for this calling that you placed on my life. And, and I want to serve you. And God says, that's exactly it. I don't remember the sins of your youth and your rebellious ways. I remember you for my love because I am good. And I remember that verse. I'm like, I love you. You, Jan, has wept that night and it transformed. And so my friend came back on Tuesday and I grabbed him. I'm like, I've got to spend some time with you tonight. He's like, what happened? I'm like, I got to tell you what. So I told him the story I just told you. And I said, I've got to confess everything to you. Everything I could ever think of in my life. I want to lay this before you. So just hear me out. This might take a while. And everything I could possibly think of, because he said, why are you telling me all this? I said, I believe what God says when he says, confess your sins to one another and then you will be healed. I want to be healed and I want to be set free. God touched my life here and I, I want to bring that to completion. So hear me out. And, and I went through everything I could possibly think of and to hear him time and time again. John, Jesus was enough. His grace is sufficient. You are forgiven in the name of Jesus. The cross was enough. He paid for that, John. You have been set free from that, John. You don't have to carry that any longer, John. Jesus paid for that, John. You're set free. And time and time again, it's like, that's why I love this psalm. That's why I love Jesus. And this idea, this is what God wants to do for you, too, by the way. And and I love this about remembering. Because in, in Hebrew, the idea to remember is to take something that happened in the past... And, and bring it to the present. That's what it means to remember. And so when God says, I will remember your sins no more. It's not that God has amnesia or he forgot. God can't forget. He's all knowing. But God says, I am going to choose to not take what happened back here and bring it to your present. And I died for that. I set you free from that. I broke those chains off. I have called you to live in that freedom. Now go and live in that freedom and help other people experience that freedom that I have for you. Now let's go on. Verse 8 and 9. Sorry, I can go on and on. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his way. He guides the humble in what is right. And he teaches them his way. And we could do a whole sermon series just on, on that verse. Because there's, there's three different ways that, that God begins this great work first thing he says he instructs and the word for instruct there is really to throw or to cast and so what i think of is a fisherman casting and this is what god does i'm going to throw you you know in the the right direction or maybe it's that god is throwing people into your life into your ways he's using nice lures and some of you are caught and the reason you're here today is because uh, god threw a spouse in your way and brought you to know Jesus. A lot of us have that story. A lot of us could get up and say, man, there are friends that God brought into my life to help me know who he is. Why, why is that happening? Because God is throwing this. That's what it means to instruct. God is, is putting everything in place for you to connect with him. And God is moving heaven and earth, and that's what he wants to do for you to know Jesus. So that's instruct. Guide. Uh, God is really a way just to lead. That's what that word means. And so it's almost like, you know, we're all blindfolded and God is leading us, but he's not going to have us trip down the stairs or, or run into a table or, or do some kind of harm to us. No, God is leading us. That's what it means to guide us. And then he's teaching us. And the word to teach is not so much, you know, words just coming out and, and let me help you to memorize some things. It's let me train you. Let me train you. Let me discipline you. Let me get more out of you like a good coach would push you beyond where you're willing to go yourself. Let me do that for you. That's what it means. And this is the work that God is doing. Verse 10. All the ways of the Lord. Not some or few. All of the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful toward those who keep the demands of his covenant. For the sake of your name, Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Oh, I love that. Man, it's, it's great. All of us could sit here and, and do. That's why we spend some time in confession. <laughs> so we can come to God and, and say, I know my iniquity is great. God, forgive me. And God says, you are forgiven. That is who you are. Build your life on that. Because <laughs> the cross was enough for you. 
Your past and your mistakes doesn't have to dictate who I'm calling you to be. Man, I've set you free from that. And if, if God can use a murderer to transform the church in a man named Paul, God can use you as well. This is what God wants to do. So let me go back to some of you who are still living in guilt and shame today. One, that's not who you are. That's not who God has called you to do. So it causes us to look at, well, why do I still feel guilt and shame if other people don't feel guilt and shame? Well, maybe it's my response to sin that determines my experience. And if my response to sin is worldly sorrow, oh, I'm sorry I got caught, that was a little embarrassing. Or if my response to sin is godly sorrow, oh, that is not who I want to be. That is not who I am. That is not who God has called me to be. I hate that. I'm turning from that. I'm repenting from that. And, and you live in that freedom and that salvation that God has paid. The cross was enough. Jesus forgave you for that. I am forgiven and you have been set free today. Whew. And then life comes. Man, that's what I want today for you. I, I want you to live. I am forgiven. And I'm forgiven in the name of Jesus. I don't have to work my way toward God. Because God worked his way toward me in Jesus. He came to me when I was lost, when I was buried in guilt and shame. God came and spoke to me. And God wants to speak to you and set you free today.